This video will contain flashing lights. Viewer discretion is advised. Greetings travelers. Welcome to the year 1999, where video games are good and nothing bad was ever made ever. Especially not Resident Evil 3, the game that marked the slight downward trend into spin-offs that have mixed to lukewarm general receptions. For those who don't know what Resident Evil is, stop living under a rock, Dad. I've talked about it at dinner unapologetically at least three times. It's a game series that is popular because it shouts its name on the title screen. Resident Evil 4. I believe all games should do this so maybe their titles won't be so lame. Like Resident Evil. It's a series that is most well known for bringing genuine terror into my soul anytime I realize I don't have enough inventory space to solve a puzzle and have to backtrack several times over. Thankfully, modern games like Signalis looked at this and said, We can do better. Here's two women making out. Rezi is also known for the world's campiest dialogue to accentuate the atmosphere. Hurry! This way! Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. To say that the franchise of biohazardous evil residents was waning is to make an accurate repetitive assessment. Welcome to the loop. You are now in it. So a new game would need to come out that would remake this series from the ground up. A true numbered sequel. One centered around action and less on survival and needed to be an exclusive release on the Nintendo GameCube, which is how we got Devil May Cry. A couple of popular designers might have been involved by the names of Hideki Kamiya and Shinji Mikami. Kamiya being the credited mastermind behind Devil May Cry, and Mikami being famous for making God Hand, obviously, and Hi-Fi Rush, of course. Insert transition sound effect here. Mikami is the original creator of Resident Evil, and the one who originally approached Kamiya to make a more action-focused sequel for Resident Evil 4. He believed the change in creative direction would prevent further stagnation with the series. Since Kamiya's team was making a combat simulator, the traditional fixed camera angles from Resident Evil were absolutely horrific to work with causing them to ditch the fixed backgrounds and implement the dynamic, dynamic cinematic, cinematic camera. camera. This would still keep the fixed camera angle style while being better for gameplay. Unfortunately, this meant they needed to make some real 3D environments. So, given the setting of Resident Evil 4, the team vacationed stressfully in the United Kingdom and Spain to photograph gothic architecture to use as inspiration and as textures. The other key piece to the puzzle is that during his time playtesting a prototype for a different hack and slash game, originally intended to be a Resident Evil spin-off, Onimusha Warlords, the game also cited as inspiration behind the God of War series, Kamiya distinctly remembered a bug where enemies were floating after getting hit. While it didn't make it into the final product, he correctly noted that this was incredibly fun. So much so that this new Resident Evil game would be built entirely around it. The combo system actively encourages it. It was around that point where Mikami insisted they scrap the Resident Evil Association entirely, because this was no longer an evil Resident game. Not as if you could remove all the influence from its original direction. Kamiya decided to scrap all the biotech that was intended to explain the character's superpowers and the monsters. Considering the setting of the game and being inspired by the Divine Comedy, he decided to theme the entire game around devils. He even named the main character Dante as a tribute. Thank you, Wikipedia. I'm sure I got all this right. Thus, Dante from the Devil May Cry series was born. Devil May Cry is famous for being the first game to let you play as Dante from the Devil May Cry series, a statement that should sell a game by itself. I too want to play as man who eat pizza and repel motorcycle with dualies. If only my one-liners could go this hard. Block off, better face. The game is so cool, it allows players to taunt enemies purely as a means to flex on them. People one step outside of the Devil May Cryosphere will say stuff like, Devil May Cry is an edgelord simulator, and they've clearly never seen Dante do anything. That's because while Dante might be the most badass man in existence, it's not because he's ambivalent, it's because he's passionate about his hobbies. He's the embodiment of the mentality that the only difference between cringe and based is confidence. If given a cast iron skillet, he'd probably start putting on a cooking show in the middle of the game and it would fit right in. It's no wonder why he's so popular with the ladies. 
I'm always saying that we need more positive male role models in video games. Dante would be a lot better if his diet wouldn't cause someone to develop a severe cardiovascular disease. The first thing out of anyone's mouth on the internet these days is, Is it still worth playing in current year? Prepare to have your entire genre obliterated. The secret to playing old games is to simply throw out all of your ideas of convenience. The follow-up to that statement is that it's not easy to do. If you grow up in a world where video games are functional, it's hard to approach games from an era where we didn't know any better. If you expect Devil May Cry 1 to be as polished as the modern titles, you need to learn to taper your expectations. Simultaneously, it's amazing how well it holds up. For 2001, yeah, no wonder this game was mind-blowingly good. The combat is still sick. Everything down to the different moves, different combo timings, different weapon feel, and of course, the parrying attacks and dodge rolling, making Devil May Cry the first game to ever make a Dark Souls reference. I should have been the one to fill your Dark Souls with light! This joke sounds incredibly dumb, but I assure you it's even stupider. This is a difficult game in the sense that players are expected to die. The benchmark for calling everything a Souls-like. On the scale of Dark Souls to God Hand, it ranks at about a pretty challenging. Not impossible, but not a cakewalk on the first go around. If you played Modern Devil May Cry, the more you play, the more you will realize just how much the series owes back to its inception. The aforementioned combat, but also every multicolored orb that serves as the game's power-ups. The red-colored orbs being earned through exploration and combat, and then being exchanged for either new moves, strengthening weapons, opening doors, or just increasing Dante's health pool so that you don't melt as fast. Exploration can also lead to partial blue orbs that increase vitality as well. All of that hasn't really changed over the years, just like Dante's personality. I'm fully convinced that a battle between Dante and Leon would consist of them attempting to one-up each other with increasingly stupid one-liners. It even has this little thing called Devil Trigger, except its form is unique depending on what melee weapon is currently equipped, something that would never come back later in the series. Just like how this boss is definitely never referenced again, and neither is this one. The game is structured as a series of missions where you get graded depending on how fast and how cool you are. Although it's obviously a bit more like a Resident Evil game that was split into missions mid-development. The game is a bit closer to its horror roots than any of the later games in the series, mostly in terms of soundtrack and how they use it. This was done to ensure that players know it's supposed to be scary in the sense that a bunch of devils are locked in a building with Dante. The story follows Dante, who gets electrocuted by a woman that looks exactly like his mother. This convinces him to go to a spooky mansion in order to stop the demon lord Mundus from invading the mortal realm. The roundhouse kicking Sparta over the lord dump is very important to the story, so that players know Dante's father was even cooler than him. Upon arriving at the haunted mansion on an island that doesn't sound like a familiar plot point at all, Dante celebrates by getting shocked by lightning and fighting underwater. This was all just a ploy by the magma, so that we would fight him three times and fight a demon that walked out of a mirror that's actually a doppelganger, that's actually Angelo, that's actually Virgil, Dante's twin brother. That's why he freaks out when he sees this pendant. He's regaining control for a second, and I didn't put this together because streaming games causes me to lose 99% of my brain cells. Hopefully that answers some questions about why I don't stream most games that I plan to make videos about. That being said, I did stream playthroughs of all of these games. Devil May Cry 1 alternates between being shockingly ahead of its time and bafflingly underbaked. Every boss will be recycled multiple times and you will enjoy it. Especially shooting Big Bird with Devil Trigger because that's the best way to cheese this garbage. Thank God this is an option. That would be the worst boss if Nightmare didn't exist, because that one makes me want to staple my balls to the ceiling. Despite unlocking several weapons, such as unceremoniously finding a shotgun on a desk, it's only possible to equip one sword and one gun-type weapon at a time, and changing between them requires pausing. The game will boil down to picking a personal favorite and sticking with it purely out of convenience. Speaking of lack of convenience, upon being ripped from the mortal realm, the game will not ask to continue, and instead, force the player to use a yellow orb to go back to the recent checkpoint. These are a limited resource, so if you don't want to waste them on that sharpie sniffer that loves camping inside of walls, an enemy that surely won't come back, 
you have to reset and do the whole level over from scratch. This continue system can lead to inexperienced players running out of yellow orbs and being forced to restart the later, much more annoying levels from the start every single time. This is known as a feedback loop in the business which rewards players who are already good and punishes players who are bad. Similar to other games from this era, the continue system is both integral for the historic experience and probably better as an optional challenge. A modern continue system in addition to the classic mode would probably be better for modern re-releases. Oh yeah. This is on the HD Collection version, in case that wasn't obvious with all the crusty so-called HD graphics. Although I'm talking about historic integrity, these are the exact same complaints and sentiments from players at the time. Which is how we got to the continue systems that we have today. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me backtrack. Combat's so solid and incredible that the final boss is half an on-rail shooter, half whatever the hell is going on here. However, this Devil Trigger form might be relevant later. It's generally a disappointing encounter, and it's likely that any of the previous bosses will be more interesting and satisfying. But the final Metroid escape sequence is neat. It also has first-person swimming segments that hold up about as well as anyone would expect. For how refined the core gameplay was for the time, it's weird that they would want to detract from it at all. A statement that will age like fine wine when looking at the game series Kamiya would later be more well known for. Dante defeats the final boss by unleashing his signature catchphrase. Jack. Unfortunately, Dante was unable to save Trish from Mundus's control, which is why she tried to kill him at first. But she did cry, which is strange because devils never cry. Which is why he did save her, because she might be a devil, but she's not a devil. No matter who you are, showing empathy is distinctly human. Also, the Devil Sword Sparta exists, the weapon wielded by Dante's father, which might be important to the plot of one or two games after this. My conclusion in this brief overview is that Devil May Cry 1 is still fun and has its own distinctness compared to the rest of the series, which is exactly what I want out of an older title. It's more approachable than trying to play something like the first Fallout game. That being said, it doesn't really have a lot of plot relevance other than Angelo taking over Virgil and Trish existing. As far as if I would personally recommend it as a starting point, most people are just going to get the HD collection, and it's not the worst first impression, but it's also not the best. I know at least a few people out there who would strongly recommend not starting with Devil May Cry 1. I say, give it a shot. If the continue system ever frustrates the hell out of you, skip it because most of the rest of the franchise is much more fun. Speaking of unfun games, Devil May Cry. After the amazing critical success of the first game, Capcom celebrated by greenlighting a sequel and completely changing the development team. Alright, this is somewhat confusing nowadays, but arcade cabinets used to be a big thing especially when they had better graphics than their console counterparts. This would fall to the wayside by the PS2 era, as it was becoming increasingly obvious that consumers were sticking more to at-home console than arcades. So, Capcom decided to shift their arcade development divisions from arcade to mostly console. Deciding that they could easily capitalize on the success of Devil May Cry, they just handed it over to a new team with very few of the original devs, headed by Noritaka Funamizu. This will seem absolutely wild, but the thought process is not completely awful. It's just bad. Mikami wanted to work on other projects, most likely the actual Resident Evil 4, and Kamiya was tied up with localizing the first Devil May Cry game. I wonder why Capcom has such good localizations. So, if they wanted to get another title out while the iron was hot, they needed to start work without him. So it's not a dumb decision. It's an incredibly greedy and dumb decision. This change in direction and lack of communication led Kamiya to believe that he was about to be fired. That wasn't the case, he was instead going to work on what eventually became Beautiful Joe, another cult classic. The new director, Funamizu, wanted his team to have creative freedom. The first game was a complete story by itself, so they could feel free to take the plot wherever they wanted and experiment with some different gameplay ideas. The game wouldn't even feature Dante, but a different protagonist who would go around New York City while fighting demons and blowing up buildings. Wait a minute. So that had to get thrown out. Somewhere down the line, the protagonist was changed back to Dante, but an unnamed producer pressured them to make him not a wisecracking dumbass like he was in the first game. Or a better way to put it, he was someone who clearly doesn't understand or enjoy Devil May Cry. 
a sentiment shared by Kamiya when he finally got to see what they were doing with their design documents after being asked for advice. Dante is intended to be a character that, to paraphrase his words, would be a guy that you want to get a drink with on the weekend and a bit of a goofball. It gets worse though. Most of the development team was not used to making 3D games, let alone 3D action games. Their previous experience was in making fighting games, something that doesn't exactly translate one-to-one -to, -one to what they were doing. They basically had to learn from the ground up. They were in contact with the original devs, but there's only so much they can do. It's not like they were bad developers, they just needed time to build up some new skills. So thankfully, they were forced to work on multiple projects at the same time. It was so bad that Devil May Cry 2 was completely unfinished six months before the planned release. I complain about corporate bullshit in video games nowadays. Well, guess what? Nothing ever changes. Deciding that they hadn't made sufficient progress on their Sisyphean task, the higher-ups changed the director last minute because it was clearly all his fault. This is a move that rightfully made most of the team very upset. Or as the new lead director, Hideaki Itsuno put it, There was a lot of drama over my replacing of the old director, and I have nothing but bad memories about that part in particular. <laughs> but basically, they said that nothing was getting done and that needed to change. The scenario hadn't been written, the cutscenes had yet to be shot, and they still hadn't decided what to do about Dante's Devil Trigger. They had determined that at least the Stinger attack was essential. So at least they had someone who was going to take care of that. But none of the other attacks have been worked on at all. Holy shit, what an absolute fucking disaster. As a compromise to Funamizu being yoinked last minute, Itsuno would be listed in the credits, and Funamizu would go uncredited entirely. Itsuno even thought about just making a whole new game and not calling it Devil May Cry. Eh, doesn't that sound familiar? That didn't end up happening, but as Itsuno mentioned, the scenario had yet to be written. By the time Bingo Moriyashi could even contribute, they already did all the levels and all the bosses, so he could only add some lines in some cutscenes to give some context. So as no surprise, Devil May Cry 2 is the first game to let you play as Lucia from the Devil May Cry series. A statement that shouldn't sell a game by itself. It's bad with some bafflingly worse parts. It's astonishing the game isn't worse, given what happened behind the scenes. It's not murdering my family and holding one of them hostage, it's more like manslaughtering them. The combat is super sluggish and floaty at the same time. The worst of both worlds. And the enemy designs and encounters are mostly bland. At first, it just feels laughably mediocre. But once the camera starts going to Uruguay, and it becomes necessary to pitch a tent with pistols, it occurs to me, I don't like this game. There aren't even different combos for different weapons. Yes, all the melee weapons are exactly the same, plus or minus a little bit of range. There's also only three of them that still need to be changed in the menu. But weirdly, it is possible to tab through different guns with the left trigger. There's very little fluff, but there is a story here. Ten years after the first game, Dante talks to a lady, not to be confused with lady, and a French grandma tells him that he needs to stop the CEO of a mega corporation that's actually a devil so that she can tell him about his father. Dante flips a coin to determine if he'll help her or not. It lands on heads, so he agrees to stop Arius from getting four artifacts to try and rule the world. Dante then finds a motorcycle. He acquires the last MacGuffin, so Arius kidnaps Lucia and uses her as a hostage to get the last piece. Dante complies and Lucia is mad that he saved her, but it was a fake. And Dante beats up Arius while he pretends like he's indifferent. I was going to be the king of this world. King? Yeah. Here's your crown. But the portal still somehow opens. Someone has to go to hell to seal it, and going to hell typically means that you can't come back. Lucia insists that she goes, so Dante flips a coin yet again saying heads he goes, tails she does. It lands on heads again, and Dante goes to the hell dimension and defeats Evil Incarnate, which is a really cool design that's completely wasted on this game. He does it without saying his iconic line, so I'll edit it in for him. Jackpot. And it feels like I missed half the context. Better play disc 2. 
Lucia is another half-demon from a group of people with demon blood that fight demons. She's been collecting all the artifacts to become all-powerful for Matier, the grandma from earlier that's actually Lucia's mom. However, she isn't actually a half-demon. She's a mannequin filled with demonic power created by Arius, which you can tell because his perfected mannequin looks exactly like her. She bears the definitely not slave mark that shows she's owned by him. F*** you, Isekai authors. And her given name is actually Kai. She's compelled to give all the artifacts over to Arius to make him as powerful as Argo Sax instead of Argo Trumpet and gets sad. Believing that she will eventually lose all control of herself because she is a puppet, she asks Dante to kill her, but cries while doing so. Dante assures her that she can't be a devil because... Devils never cry. The stories converge and Dante defeats Arius, but the portal still opens. He flips the coin and goes to hell in Lucia's place, giving her his coin as a keepsake. But Arius is not actually dead because the ritual still kinda worked. So Lucia has to defeat Ascended Arius while Dante fights in hell itself. After defeating her creator, Lucia looks at the coin and realizes it was a double-sided coin the entire time. Which is incredibly fitting for Dante even if he was mostly silent for the entire game. Lucia goes back to his office, believing that Dante will return. She hears the sound of a familiar motorcycle, indicating that Dante did in fact return from hell. That might sound like a stupid abridged summary, but that's honestly longer than the amount of context given by the game itself. <sighs> okay. The story beats themselves are pretty in line for a Devil May Cry game. There's just barely any execution to speak of. Dante's silence for most of the game leaves me more sad than anything else. There's definitely a reality out there where this game is made with the proper time and resources and easily becomes a classic. But it's not the reality we live in. Despite its insanely short development time, it does have more unique bosses and barely any recycled ones like the but that's because most of the bosses have like three attacks, and you'd have to ignore the entire Lucia playthrough. Devil May Cry 2 is like playing a generic hack and slash made for kids, but edgy. It's also an insult to audio mixing. What was that, dude? In conclusion, I would not call Devil May Cry 2 completely bad, but it has a worse B word associated with it, which is boring. It was not meant to be a difficult game, but I do think that was for the best because otherwise, it would just be frustrating. It's also silly because challenge is still a big part of Devil May Cry as a series. To be good at using all the moves requires work, so that the execution feels like something earned and not automatic. Which is why 2 feels so bland at its core, despite having two playable characters. Since I am insulting the worst game in the franchise, there are a few ideas that shine through. There are different Devil Trigger augments to collect throughout the game, which make you faster, or grant the ability to fly. There isn't anything 100% like this in later titles, but it's hard not to draw a line between this and the later traversal power-ups. I can't give it too much credit, because Dante's final Devil Trigger form from the first game could already fly, but it is still utilized in a very different way. It also has a dedicated dodge roll button, instead of overloading the jump input. As stupid as this will sound, this is probably where Trickster Style got its start, which would expand into the entire style system. Crazy to say it out loud, but it's right there. It is still the first game in the franchise to implement multiple playable characters. Sucks that it's underbaked, but credit where credit's due. Finally, the second to final boss being a corrupted amalgamation of all the previous bosses throughout the campaign that uses all of their combined attacks is pretty cool. Still horribly executed. Before Funamizu departed, he felt like his team's original contributions were too focused on being something different rather than celebrating what people enjoyed about the first game. There is no way to be certain exactly what was there before rushing to get the game done, but it does make me ponder. It's not going to change my opinion though. If Devil May Cry 1 is maybe worth a playthrough, Devil May Cry 2 is maybe worth never bundling in any major re-releases. Unless they ever decided to remake the entire game from scratch and give everyone the Devil May Cry 2 they deserve. It is not only safe to skip the game, doing so will actively improve your opinion of the franchise. It's not the game's fault it's so terrible after learning about its history, but the end result is still a waste of time in all the wrong ways. It'd be more fun to wait in line for plain toast. Devil May Cry. 
Devil May Cry 2 still had pretty decent sales at the time of its release, but unsurprisingly, it wasn't super well received, and the creators behind it knew it was bad. Itsuno himself being brought in at the last minute didn't want this to be his legacy with the series. He demanded that they get another crack at it, but with him as the lead director on the project from the start. Despite the understandably initial hostile welcoming, many of the team's developers felt the same way. They managed to salvage something kinda cohesive in like six months. Imagine what they could do with proper time and resources. So, Capcom approved a sequel. Bingo Morihashi, the scenario writer, asked Kamiya if it was okay to make a prequel for the series, focusing on Dante and his brother Virgil. In the first game, Virgil is supposed to be killed by demons long ago before being turned into a puppet by Mundus. Morihashi wanted to create a parallel universe for the Devil May Cry series, where that didn't happen. Instead, Kamiya gave him full permission to retcon the entire plotline since he was going to be moving away from the series. As a side note, Morihashi is the main scenario writer for the rest of the Devil May Cry games, and is even credited with working on both the Dragon's Dogmas. It would appear that he and Itsuno like to work together. So, with a few years of hard work overhauling all the Devil May Cry 2 systems to be... not that, which involved reinventing the... Dynamic Cinematic Camera but a bit less fixed than the first game, bringing back all the different moves and a refocus on challenge, the third Devil May Cry type game was born. Devil May Cry 3 Dante's Awakening Special Edition is the first game to let you play as Virgil from the Devil May Cry series, a statement that should sell a game by itself. Of the original trilogy, this game is widely considered to be the best, which is why it's sold the least. From the moment the game boots up, it's obvious why. Wait a minute. Two Dantes? I can't believe this series can have fun cutscenes and fun combat. That's because it's not a hard game. I never got bodied by Cerberus. It's actually because I could start pole dancing to beat the shit out of demons. This is when Devil May Cry feels like the series came into its own. The horror setting is just a backdrop for the badasses, and it gave Dante his goofy edge in contrast to his much more serious brother. Remember that Edgelord Simulator comment that I made up and attributed to someone who doesn't exist? Well, Virgil is the true Edgelord of the Devil May Cry series. Die, scum. You are not worthy as my opponent. This is a man who is motivated by a singular notion. To become more powerful. Forgive me, father, for I have already begun my Sigma Ascension. Therefore, he is not of the evil alignment and is firmly chaotic neutral or a murder hobo in D&D terms. Virgil would do anything if it meant he could get a leg up on his little brother. So to answer the question of who would win in a fight between Virgil and any other fictional character, it all hinges on if Virgil thought it would help him defeat Dante. Programming Virgil took significantly more effort thanks to his coat physics. The devs joked that he should take it off to make their lives easier, but they knew it was far too important to his character bask in all of its glory. Yeah, I need to talk about graphics. The footage on screen is still from the HD collection where, um, there are some issues that people rightfully have. See if you can spot the difference with the OG Steam version that's delisted and impossible to get modern controllers to work on. Believe me, I tried. What the heck happened to his hair? Anything that's pre-rendered won't look like pasta, so it's pretty jarring when you realize what you're missing out on. There's lots of other comparisons, and the original Steam port has its own problems, but I don't want to play through the entire game on keyboard, just to mention that many textures and effects got lost in translation. It's not unplayable because I barely cared in the moment. The action and delivery still carry the experience. However, as a true patrician would say, these type of poorly done remakes give the PS2 era a bad rep in terms of presentation. Even without a CRT monitor, the original just looks better. Not everything holds up, but arguably the most iconic scene from the game looks way too strange with the weird PNG so prominent in the background. Give that to me. No way. You got your own. Well, I want yours too. Look at how they massacred my boy. With that side tangent out of the way, Virgil is Dante's older twin brother. He's meant to be more challenging to play as than Dante, so much so that the devs had more fun putting his kit together, but couldn't fit all of it into the special edition. That's why the player can't use all of his boss attacks. 
Releasing the game multiple times might seem like a dick move, but it truly was done out of love. Virgil's popularity internally is unsurprising, considering he is effectively their original character, and Dante is someone else's brainchild. They even comment that Morihashi was more interested in writing about Virgil than Dante. Virgil ends up being the more popular character externally as well. Hilarious, because Dante's characterization feels massively improved from the original game. The game begins with a cutscene where a lady explains the legend of Roundhouse kicking Sparta and the relationship between his sons, Dante and Virgil. They constantly fight each other to see who's stronger in a twisted form of pleasure. Our journey actually starts with Dante receiving a polite invitation from a preacher to go to a hip and cool new church that totally isn't like a traditional church with his older brother Virgil. He's then stabbed by a bunch of demons for committing acts of blasphemy. Dante brushes them off and starts the jukebox on the first try. This party's getting crazy. If much of the series owes its ideas back to the original, then the rest of it is owed back to the third. Switching between two sets of melee and ranged weapons on the fly, and the upping of the over-the-top style. Oh yeah, the style button is here. The classics of Trickster, Gunslinger, Royal Guard, and Swordmaster and Quicksilver and Doppelganger. There can only be one style equipped at a time, and they can only be changed at Mission Select or at Divinity Statues. Unlike everything else in the game, its level up is tied to an experience point system and not Red Orb investments. In other words, I use Swordmaster for most of the entire game, because it's what gates the rest of every weapon's moveset. It is the first iteration on styles, so it is a bit clunky. My biggest complaint is that despite wanting to stick with Swordmaster, some encounters will feel like they are assuming the player will switch to Trickster. These are bosses which have a divinity statue right before them, so it's not like switching is hard. And this is also the game that introduced the option to continue an unlimited amount of times. Gold orbs are like yellow orbs but are used to revive mid-combat, making this the first documented Sekiro reference in gaming. Upon dying enough times in a row, Devil May Cry 3 etched a message deep into the psyche of every Sigma male's worst nightmare by unlocking Easy Mode, which also makes this the first documented pointless difficulty argument ever recorded. Quicksilver and Doppelganger are cool unlocks, but they would not make a return as styles. Style switching on the fly wasn't invented until Devil May Cry 4, and this makes me wonder what it would be like to play Devil May Cry 3 with the modern switching systems. Speaking of Switch, Remember the whole HD version and all the stupid textures? Well, there is another port that exists that still looks like shit. The Switch version. Rather than having the HD collection, they made separate releases for the first three games to make more money. Oh god, a standalone Devil May Cry 2. Since they reported Devil May Cry 3 yet again, they added some bonuses like a small, entire co-op mode with Virgil. But more importantly, added in the modern freestyle switching as an option. Now, this is not the historic way to play the game in terms of playstyle, and it can definitely trivialize some encounters, but, I mean, come on, this is pretty fucking cool. If I was asked what the best way to play the game is in current year and this is an option, this is the way to go, especially if you're already planning on skipping 1 and 2. Even Devil May Cry 3 purists will look past the graphic fidelity to get a taste of that sweetness. Or should I say, taste the blood. Such a shame that this version doesn't exist anywhere else. As far as all the parrying and dodge rolling goes, this is like the first game but faster, without losing all the weight. Parrying has been up to extreme degrees by allowing some bosses to be completely disarmed if lingering hitboxes are abused correctly. It's possible to scrape by, but also possible to completely mop the floor with the blood of your enemies while power sliding with an electric guitar that summons a swarm of bats. That was obtained by seducing a succubus through combat, but I'm getting ahead of myself again. After defending his new office by sneezing, Virgil rides a scissor lift up to the final boss arena. Dante has to go to the club on the way to the tower to adopt a dog by turning him into nunchucks, then fight a weird clown by making him dance by shooting his feet. It certainly isn't a perfect game because some encounters are boring or frustrating, or when fighting the flying centipede thing, both. But they are the exception, not the rule. After he stabs a lift and walks across solid air, Dante fights two statues that turn into a pair of annoying talking swords that he demands to shut up, leading us to believe that talking weapons would never make an appearance later in the series. 
These are all just part of the normal steps to go through in order to formally meet a lady. Think Bayonetta with a bit more guns and a bit more anger. Nevertheless, incredibly badass. This lady is essentially their do-over, to make a companion character in the plot who also fights demons and hates herself for partially being one. To be fair, her father is a big piece of shit that sold them out to become a powerful devil, and has no humanity left in him. Just because he's a human doesn't mean he can't be like a demon. He even throws his own daughter off a cliff for laughs. Somehow in the middle of this, I had to fight a bunch of enemies while keeping two switches active, and it was a very bad time. Dante is able to save that lady from falling to her death and attempts to put the moves on her, which goes about as well as anyone would expect. Getting shot in the head three times is a small price to pay for that type of harassment, Dante. Also that he can stop his brother from opening a portal to the demon realm to get more power. Or at least that's what the preacher man tells him will happen. You sure know how to throw a party. No food. No drinks, and the only babe just left. My sincerest apology, brother. I was so eager to see you, I couldn't concentrate on the preparations for the bash. These five lines of dialogue better describe Dante and Virgil's relationship than anything in the intro. Given Virgil's normally serious demeanor, even he plays along with Dante's smack talk because they are not one-dimensional characters. This is a 3D game. Dante wins but loses in the cutscene because he's a fool. Might controls everything. And without strength, you cannot protect anything. Let alone yourself. Through the art of media analysis, we can deduce that Virgil believes in gaining power to protect that which matters, and Dante believes in nothing in particular currently. Thus being stabbed by his own sword awakens Dante to the ability to bang 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 pull his devil trigger. Don't try that at home, travelers. Virgil leaves because Church Pants assures them that they have all they need after stealing Dante's neck accessory. So, Dante must run down the side of the building while blasting music to get eaten alive by a flying leviathan. It's all according to Keikaku. He must give the monster diverticulitis by fighting the organs that summon demons. Being covered in demonic blood is certainly going to improve his chances with the ladies. I guess she's not into that. It makes sense to go to the bottom of this tower because that's where Virgil gets Preacher Man to open the final door for him. Virgil kills him in the process because he's definitely a bad dude that's definitely trying to plot something. Dante goes deeper underground to win the aforementioned succubus over by performing a concert. Nivan is probably one of the best Devil May Cry weapons ever conceived, which is why I didn't use it for this playthrough. Meanwhile, Dante must start ballin' to open a door and find the lady behind it. I see you got daddy issues. I've got daddy issues too. Issues not being your daddy. This lady gets to have a heart-to-heart -heart with her totally possessed father that's totally bleeding out who totally isn't faking all of this just to get her closer to the hell portal by convincing her that it was all Virgil's idea. Then he has to ride a minecart and fight an angry winged monster, but not actually kill him. Instead blind him because he would rather threaten the clown. Then ride the minecart back while his health is constantly being drained. The now blind demon dude uses Dante's scent to locate Dante, but it's actually Virgil. So Virgil murders him in one hit. Hey, I weakened him first. To turn him into his second weapon. Dante kills the last time traveling horse in existence to unlock Zawaldo style. Virgil uses the locket that he and Dante got from their mother who looks like Trish to open the portal. The only thing that's left to complete the ritual is figure out why my particle emitter is crashing resolve. Why isn't this working? Is there something missing? Must more blood be shed? It's time for another stand-up meeting with Virgil to see how many story points we both acquired. Wait a minute, I think this preacher guy is also the evil clown and probably a bad guy. Also, his daughter has the sacred blood needed to truly complete the ritual. This could be a problem. See you later, Virgil. The lady chases after her father after being stabbed because she might not be fully human. In order to get back to the top, Dante has to go to the club to get his motorcycle that can drive up walls. However, he is stopped by that lady again who refuses to let him kill her father. Dante assures her that it's not a human's job, but it turns out that it's personal. They have a friendly conversation to settle their differences. Dante explains that he understands it's a family matter, but his own brother now wants to open a portal to Demonville, so it's a family matter for him too. He didn't have much of a stake in things before, but he finally understands what's important to him now. He'll settle the matter for her too. Before he leaves, she gives him her spare rocket launcher. 
Dante is then stopped by a platforming segment that I was very good at, just like that doppelganger fight that I did not understand the gimmick to, and will pretend like is objectively bad game design. Evil Preacher Clown Man now harnesses the power of Sparta to become a god and rule the world, annoying that he set up a chessboard full of demons and a bunch of rematches with the previous bosses to stall for time. Upon reaching the top of the tower for real this time, Preacher Man explains that he is now Sparta, but Dante assures him that his father was much more attractive because, look at Dante and his brother. That's the cue for Virgil to help out Dante and eliminate the last remnants of the church in this game. They both unleash their superpower by hitting him with the jackpot. Not very classy for someone's dying words. Except he didn't die because he fell next to his daughter whose given name is actually Mary, but she refuses to let this demonic filth dictate her identity. Mary died a long time ago. My name is Lady. Yes, she got that idea because Dante just calls her lady for the whole game. That would be the end of everything, but the power of Sparta is still unleashed and waiting to be claimed. I wonder if a certain someone still wants it. I need more power. And we're supposed to be twins. Twins. The game climaxes in a battle for all the waifus against an opponent who truly equals or perhaps exceeds Dante in power. While being unfazed by the massive amount of rushing water, fear running water travelers, that shit is no joke. You will not forget this devil's power. Where's your motivation? Rest in peace. Don't get so cocky. You shall die. Now this is what would make the series iconic. A perfect final boss. After his victory, Dante tries to save Virgil from falling into the underworld, but Virgil would never admit defeat. He'd rather fall to his death and claw his way back to the mortal realm. Dante. 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 Going outside, the clouds finally clear up. Dante sheds a tear thinking Virgil is gone for good, but when Lady asks him about it, he says that it's just the rain, because this is a Full Metal Alchemist reference because Devils Never Cry. Then it plays the song called Devils Never Cry, proving that Devil May Cry 3 isn't a game about style, it's about family. And just because someone's a devil doesn't mean they're a devil. Afterwards, everyone collectively knew they just experienced the best Devil May Cry type game of all time at that time. It also allowed them to replay the entire game as Virgil and fight Virgil as Virgil. This is one of those bonus modes where the player gets to be the final boss of the game. However, there are two things I want to point out in particular. The first is realizing that executing good combos takes effort. Thus the Virgil that we fight in game really is just that good. The other thing that goes easily unnoticed is how Virgil's moveset and animations are the perfect contrast to Dante's. Dante always feels like he's more concerned with showing off than killing things, while Virgil's attacks are ruthlessly efficient with just the right amount of flair. Most of the time his sword is sheathed because it's unnecessary. However, the sheath itself is also a further extension of his arsenal. Who comes up with this? Was it you? Whoever it was? 20 out of 10. Game of the Millennia. It perfectly encapsulates the two main demographics of Devil May Cry players. American and American Weeaboo. Devil May Cry. After that resounding success, demand rose to moderate levels for yet another game. Itsuno and company were already two steps ahead. Wanting to push the series forward, the new game would feature a new protagonist with new gameplay. Then, a producer stepped in when he remembered the general negative response to a different protagonist in a Metal Gear Solid 2 type game. I will not tolerate this right in slander. And now it's funny to look at that series with that statement in mind. But yes, in order to get the game shipped, Dante would need to be playable. So, that's where they started as a proof of concept. It would also be made for the brand new HD PS3. They believed this would allow them to expand out the world and add in new mechanics that weren't possible on the PS2. Although it's not cited as inspiration, they did conveniently take a trip to Vatican City before making the game. Everything was going anything but swimmingly. 
Morihashi quit in the middle of development, being unhappy with Capcom, but was ultimately convinced to return after Itsuno asked him to. So just a small hiccup in the grand scheme of things, this was also one of their first cracks at developing for the PS3. For those who are unaware, the PS3 is notoriously hard to utilize its full potential. With how standardized internal architecture for consoles are today, it's easy to forget yesterday. Because marketing wanted a release on both the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360, knowing that the 360 was more popular in the US, they would instead use a cross-platform engine. So, they just have to learn cross-platform development, which they hadn't really done before, deal with PlayStation 3 shenanigans, and make two fully playable characters out the gate in order to release the game. Surely, this wouldn't cause any problems. To put it bluntly, Devil May Cry 4 is the first game to let you play as Nero from the Devil May Cry series, a statement that should sell a game by itself. Nero is a little angry boy because his father figure is the Pope, representing the world's least combative teenage atheist growing up in a religious household. From a gameplay perspective, playing Devil May Cry 5 made me think that timings for mastering Exceed were tight. Devil May Cry 4 makes 5 Exceed timings look like it was made for preschoolers. I can't even get close to good at it because I'm bad. Unlike his progenitor, Nero's gameplay involves one weapon and one gun, while focusing almost entirely on precise timings to do maximum damage. The reason its execution is so tough isn't just because the frame windows are tiny, it's also because flaming attacks have different animation speeds to adjust to on the fly. This feeds into itself very well, like executing a tough sonata on the piano, but the melody will still shine through if you suck. Nero's other main gimmick is that he casually has a demonic arm, making this the first documented god hand reference in gaming, which acts as a finisher, combo extender, grappler mechanic, and anything else that can be imagined. Instead of getting extra weapons, Nero's arm gets extra abilities. Even without the power-ups, it's entertaining just to see what Devil Breaker does to all the different enemy types, especially the bosses. Overall, Nero's kit is incredibly well thought out and well put together. It's clear that they wanted something that was a bit more approachable for newcomers, while still offering some spice to those who want more. He's a seamless addition to the Devil May Cry boys, especially all of his extra shit talk. Hey! <laughs> Adios, kid. The game starts with bad boy Nero going to church to impress a lady, but mass is interrupted when Dante assassinates the Pope. A bit of a rough day. Nero isn't very happy about this and turns Dante into the tutorial battle. The streets are flung into chaos because there are demons everywhere and I'm sure that it was all Dante's fault. So it's up to Nero to defend Kyrie and her brother. Kratos will surely find a safe place for Kyrie to hide away and won't be a major adversary in Nero's mission for love. The time has come and so have I. First thing of note, the camera isn't very cinematic, but don't worry, that's because it's outdoors. It'll get cinematic later when strolling through that classic, Devil May Cry gothic architecture. Like its predecessors, this is a game about acquiring traversal power-ups to be able to grapple grim orbs and push blocks. So a bit less about finding a key, and instead finding the power-up that acts as a glorified key. Or in this case, find the button to activate the crane that doesn't work so Nero punches it instead. It appears that the demons are coming out of portals that were made by the church. At least that's what I can interpret based on where the flaming horseman materialized from. Upon getting walled by this first boss, one of the most controversial mechanics of this game series rears its ugly head. After dying three times, the game will forcibly activate enemy handicap, which reduces the difficulty down a notch. Doesn't matter how close you are to beating a boss on your third try, helicopter mommy will step in and tell you that it's too much for you to handle. As a way to piss off man-children like myself, this is a fantastic idea. That's exactly what I want to happen when I'm frustrated against a tough enemy. But it feels like it kind of misses the point. Devil May Cry 3 already had the easy mode unlock joke after the player dies enough times, but that's just letting them know they can tap out. Simply giving the option to retry a particular segment on a lower difficulty without having to reset the whole playthrough probably would have made more sense. Struggling a few times and only barely losing to then retry and watch the boss melt on the next attempt makes me feel like a husk of a chair. Good thing I beat Fireboy in one try then. After sending that big demon back to hell, Nero watches an extremely hot lady eviscerate some enemies. However, 
He is unfazed thanks to his dedication to Kyrie, which allows him to push further into An Orlando. You know, it just occurred to me. Some of these enemies are a little obnoxious. The biggest offenders are definitely the sharpie sniffers that love clipping through walls. Even mashing devil gripper to make them vulnerable is just tedious. Thankfully, they only appear all the time to slow down these already very drawn out levels and they wouldn't make a bigger, more annoying version of them later on. Time to enjoy that platforming challenge that every time I fail I have to do the same combat sequence again as punishment. Back in the story, Nero thinks that the church he stumbled into is a bit suspicious, not because of all the ice demons, but because of all the books. Stabbing these knights with their own lances is pretty nifty. Nero then has to fight a frog that baits people with innocent dancing maidens that is also responsible for all the icy terrain. Definitely not the fact that the church is in the Himalayas. After demonstrating proper dental hygiene, Nero sends them back through the fire exit. Then he breaks a painting of the Pope in an act of blasphemy. It turns out, it only looked like the Pope was dead. He can revive himself with demonic powers, just like the real Pope. I'm starting to wonder if they're not as moral of an organization as they claim to be, just like the real Catholic Church. The Pope explains that the Ascension Ceremony is what allowed him to not die, and they should congregate again to assuage everyone's fears about his timely demise. The suspicious scientist man wants Kratos to stop Nero from possibly stumbling into his very ethical research, but Kratos insists that it's more important that he find Dante. Nero stumbles into said ethical research facility after playing a board game with some demon dice. Scientist man gets upset and creates one of the most obnoxious boss fights I've ever experienced in my life. After beating that very quickly, Nero threatens the man who's more interested in inappropriately touching Nero's arm, just like a real church father. He reveals that all the clergymen are fusing themselves with demonic power to become angels, and definitely not demons, to take over the world as decreed by the Pope. Wait, isn't that also the plot to Bayonetta? They plan to use a very special looking katana to open a big portal to the Hell Dimension. All of his talk was just to stall for time in order to restrain Nero for humane scientific testing. Too bad Nero can't fight back. If only he had more power. I wonder if Nero is related to anyone in the series. Maybe it's Dante. Thus, Nero learns how to bang bang bang, pull his devil trigger. He then has to find his way to a bridge that was made by fighting hordes of more garbage and slowing down time. By going into a cave in the middle of the Himalayas, he stumbles into a very expected environment. What the hell is this? Meanwhile, at the round table, Kratos is called out for knowing that Nero was part demon but not sharing with the class. Kratos feigns ignorance and still insists that he should focus on tracking Dante. Unfortunately for him, the hot lady we saw earlier says that she can track Dante if that's getting in the way. Kratos says that he doesn't think she's a trustworthy person, but the Pope says it's okay. She gave them the Devil Sword Sparta and helped them make their savior. So he touches Kratos' hand with all the delicacy of an archbishop in the presence of an unaccompanied minor, insisting that he find Nero. Back in the jungle, frustrating enemy number 61 shows up, which is a puppet possessed by a plant that flings out random hitboxes to prevent comboing, and once again, makes me double down on my bad gameplay. Maybe some pushing puzzles in a boss fight can help me get past that. Okay Google, can plants be attractive? After defeating the boss that surely won't come back, I got stuck on a puzzle where I need to follow where the shadow is pointing. Game reviewer detected? Give me that enemy handicap. After finally breaking out of that humid hellscape, it seems like Kratos isn't 100% on Nero's side. For you see, he has ascended into an angel. But as Nero rightfully points out, you become a demon. Pretty sick boss fight. Challenging in all the right ways and Kratos is a good rival for Nero. Thank god I died on that attempt and got handicapped. Unfortunately for Nero, he's caught in 4k by Kyrie killing her brother Kratos. This would be a hard situation to clear up, but thankfully, evil scientist Preacher Man appears and explains that the Pope wants her taken hostage. This speeds up the process of Kyrie and Kratos realizing this church might be bad. Kratos runs after Kyrie, so back to another church-like building for some cool time manipulation puzzles and that advanced sharpie sniffer that I claim didn't exist. Nero finally gets to have his showdown with scientist Angel Bug Boy and get all of his power sucked out of him. That's why he didn't actually win and can't reach Kyrie in time to save her. 
only grabbing her necklace in the process which sends him into a fit of gamer rage. That's why we have to go to the Giant Blender, a key component of every ethical research facility. This platform bonus mission is also a bad time. Chasing Kyrie further into the facility of frustration, Nero accidentally finds the man that nobody else could. What do you want, Dante? He wants to slam Nero into a wall to get the Yamato back. Nero explains that he needs all the power he can get, so that's gonna be a no-go. I'm sure I will understand this fight completely and not enemy handicap my way into a win. The secret is to spam Devil Buster and never try to combo in a Devil May Cry game. Nero loses in the cutscene to cutscene Dante. He explains that the katana is a family heirloom, and he wants to keep it in the family. He's not trying to stop Nero, he just wants the sword. Nero calmly says that he won't be able to succeed without it, to which Dante now says he can keep it. I wonder what changed his mind. That hot lady shows up again, but it turns out she's Trish who's been undercover the entire time. She's not sure it's a good idea to leave it all to Nero, but Dante assures her that if Nero screws up, he'll take care of it himself. Classic Dante. Time for another level that somehow looks the same except for this giant statue that I'm currently climbing. The Pope reveals that he put Kyrie in the statue and Kyrie reveals she ran out of recorded voice lines for the rest of the game. The Pope tells Nero that he should be happy because Nero will become one with Kyrie to form the core of the Savior. Go blow yourself! I'd like to thank this game for allowing players to fight the Pope at full power while he screams that he's coming. <laughs> Like the rest of the game, Nero loses in the cutscene, but gets help from Kratos, who also loses in the cutscene. The Pope is shocked at Kratos' betrayal, but he did it because he loves his sister. The Pope explains that love is gay and a waste of time. Here at Misshapen Chair, LLC, we do not endorse the use of the term gay as a pejorative. This scene is meant to be comedic by emulating said behavior while emphasizing the stupidity of this type of comment. Using the term gay to describe love is ironic. Love comes in all shapes and forms, yet showing affection is largely viewed as a form of weakness by the villains throughout the series. This irony is further emphasized by the evil Pope saying it because love is supposed to be a core principle of Christianity. Devil May Cry has always demonstrated that true power comes from love and compassion, not throwing everything away in the pursuit of power. The evil Pope is the embodiment of this principle, as he poorly attempts to make fun of Kratos for caring about his sister. Oh. Dante and Trish show up to smack talk Nero as he's defeated. It's how they show affection. Kratos tells Dante about their plan to open the real hell gate to kill a bunch of people but save them so they look really cool and win them all over. Just like the real church. Rest in peace Kratos. You were a cool guy and I liked your voice. It's time for gameplay round 2 featuring Dante from the Devil May Cry series. As I might have mentioned a few times before, this is the game where style switching was introduced and is a very welcomed addition. Gotta whip out the claw grip for maximum efficiency. Despite its troubled development history, I personally think Dante is fun to play as in Devil May Cry 4. This is a divisive opinion. As far as the levels go, he simply plays the game backwards from where Nero came from but with 99% of the puzzles already solved. It's very clear that Dante being playable meant that they spent most of their time trying to make him functional and not about adding any new levels. Smart given what they had to work with, but it makes a game that felt a bit stretched out feel very stretched out. The only positive thing is that it's very fast compared to playing through as Nero, not just because the levels are shorter, but because Dante does like double his damage. After unlocking Dante, it's a good idea to power up. Another thing unique to this game is that powering up works slightly differently. There are two types of currencies, Red Orbs and Proud Souls. Proud Souls are earned at the end of each mission or after dying and spent purely on weapon and ability upgrades. Red Orbs on the other hand are purely for health and devil trigger upgrades and consumable items. All the resources are given to both characters equally meaning you can feel free to dump everything into upgrades because they both contribute to their own totals. 
I like this idea from the perspective that players don't feel like they're wasting their resources upgrading their stats instead of their abilities. In the past, it was more of a choice to invest into either offense or defense, which means I glass cannon much of the games and died frequently. It's likely that many players also did this and artificially made the game harder than it's intended. The way they combated this in the past is that weapon upgrades would get so expensive, upgrading health became more appealing because it was so cheap. They're practically paying you to not die. However, finding a stash of red orbs is disappointing because I know it doesn't help me get anything other than stats. I do like each character having the same full pool of resources from a psychological perspective. I never feel like I'm wasting anything, but it's not actually a problem in a later title because the numbers are balanced accordingly. But it is interesting enough that I think it's worth revisiting, which is why they would never use this system again. Back to the story, Dante escapes the meat grinding facility that is self-destructing. In a flashback, we learn that Dante is a raging atheist who doesn't think that a church that worships Sparta is intrinsically bad, even though they worship a demon as a god. Lady's new design might be a bit too much if you ask me. Lady explains that the order in charge of the church is collecting demonic arms and capturing demons. She believes that's a sign that something not so holy and wholesome is happening. Dante is more interested in pizza, but maybe this job can keep him distracted. Trish already left because that's all she needed to hear. It's now raining in the jungle. Through a narrative act of pure insanity, it is revealed that Nero didn't solve anything by shoving the demons back into portals. It just delayed them for a little bit so that Dante can finish the job. This undermines Nero's character just a tiny bit, but I'll take it if it means I get to watch Dante be a goofball when unlocking new demonic arms. After speed running through those electric enemies that are very stupid, the painting of the Pope has really chilled out. I wonder if the frog demon is back. This boss battle is so easy, Dante kills like 50 of them in the cutscene, which gives access to one of the coolest weapons in the entire franchise, a briefcase that changes into 666 billion different guns, and even has a mode where it turns into a giant death row scope that fires off the equivalent of 1% of America's munition reserves. This feels like it's straight out of something I imagined in my childhood. It's so cool, it would never make a return in the series. Now Dante has to navigate through a facility being filled with a deadly neurotoxin, and do that one sword barrier boss fight that was just as fun as it was the first time around. Be careful Dante, wolves hunt in packs. Dante kills the flaming horse demon for real this time and unlocks another incredibly cool weapon from the series. Lucifer impales swords into enemies through various combos, then, as a finisher, Dante throws a rose that causes all of them to explode. It's so perfectly Devil May Cry. Such a great idea with all right implementation that it would never appear later in the- Okay. They obviously want some unique weapons for each game to make them distinct. But I do wish they brought back Lucifer or Navan in some capacity. That's all the weapons in the game acquired, so it's off to the city to close the portal. But there's one angelic mad scientist bug boy left. Dante must put on a stage blade to communicate that he's going to kick his ass that hard. Bugman refuses to believe that he was defeated. Dante explains that Bug Boy lost because he threw away his humanity. This confuses the Bug Boy because he doesn't understand how that works scientifically. Dante scientifically asks him to look between his eyebrows. Then he takes the Yamato and unlocks the legendary 7th style button where he does a Virgil impression. Dark Slayer is cool and I'm tired of pretending that it's not. In a throwback to Devil May Cry 1, we get the AAA open world gaming equivalent of a boss fight. Extremely large with little to no satisfaction but at least it looks cool. Just like how Dante is able to return the Yamato to Nero to take down the savior from the inside. The game celebrates Nero's rescue by making the player refight the bosses a third time in a row. I am still flabbergasted by this decision. Maybe it's a remnant of the game before they decided to make Dante replay all the same levels, but the third rematches really are the icing on the stale cake. With that recycled content out of the way, Nero finds Kyrie who still can't talk. The Pope wonders why Nero betrayed the Order just like Kratos. Nero says that it was all fine until they threatened Kyrie, to which the Pope laughs at Nero for being pathetic enough to experience love, just like the real Pope. 
So the Pope slurps up the power of the Devil Sword Sparta to ascend into his final boss form, which isn't that different from his other boss form. Unfortunate for him, my parry timings are too good. In his final moments, the Pope demands to know why he can't use the full power of Sparta. Nero explains that Sparta wasn't strong because he was strong. It's because he got pussy. In response, the Pope promptly tries to execute Kyrie like a true incelibate. Nero, now obtaining Nirvana, sends the Pope back to Giga Hell. Kyrie is so impressed by Nero's sick moves, she doesn't know what to say. I love a happy ending. Except, the sentient savior statue grows a beard, which means I have to decline a Manscaped sponsorship. Nero lands one final punch to send home the fact that respecting women is what turns you into a god. And that just because he has a demon's power, doesn't mean that he can't use it for good. I guess I should thank you. <laughs> but that'd be out of character. Dante insists that Nero keep the Yamato because it's his now. Not sure what he meant by that. Kyrie finally finds her voice and sees Nero's demonic arm for the first time. He reveals that he's actually part demon. He never wanted her to find out because she only likes humans. Nero, you're you. And it's you I want to be with. I don't know anyone who is as human as you are. That's the cheesy shit I want from these games. Why do the demons have to interrupt this sweet moment? And that's the end of the fourth Devil May Cry type game. Aren't there more gameplay modes? They worship a demon as a god. Oh yeah. Our favorite murder hobo is playable in the special edition yet again. Canonically, Virgil showed up here years before Dante and company to do something. Or should I say someone? Gotta get that power up. None of that shines through in the gameplay, which is, uh, kinda incredible. Some people prefer Devil May Cry 4 Virgil above any other game, and that's because of an accidental act of genius. Every move in his kit can be cancelled into a trick teleport, which can result in the most cracked combos known to mankind. This is the game that also made it possible to use Judgment Cut End. I won't show too much because this is also the game where Trish and Lady are playable. Trish is like a watered down Dante, which is kind of a shame, but Lady... Lady is a kick-ass character to play as. I think this speaks for itself. It makes me wish she got to be playable in other games. Too bad she's relegated to this one. In conclusion, it's a mixed bag. On one hand, a fun combat core and a fun story, but poorly paced. It drives home the point that it wants to and is perfectly on the nose for the series. At the same time, it's clearly unfinished and padded out so that people wouldn't complain about its runtime on their favorite forums. Dante is fun to play as, in my opinion, but it's so short-lived, it's a wonder why he's even in the game at all. It's definitely the test for anyone who says that a good combat core is all a game needs to be fun. Because if that were completely true, Bloody Palace would be all that you need to have fun in any game. It's not a bad entry in the series because Devil May Cry 2 will always be worse than anything else. There are people who love this game wholeheartedly, and I can see why. It has its moments where it shines, and the core combat is still good. Not a bad first step into next gen, but they could definitely do better next time. Can't wait for the next game. What year is it? Devil May Cry. Capcom, deciding that selling four quadrillion copies in the West wasn't good enough when compared to Call of Duty, even though it was literally the best-selling Devil May Cry game of all time at that time, decided that people just hate Devil May Cry and will never play another one made by Japan. Yep, it's definitely a commercial failure and definitely had zero Western fans. That's why the next entry in the series would be a reboot made by Ninja Theory. After that fiasco, fans were concerned that Devil May Cry was a dead series. It only had a manga, an anime, a merchandise line, several cameos. Okay, to be fair, Capcom had expressed they felt Devil May Cry 4 didn't sell well enough, and they already partially outsourced a reboot that ended up being more like a collaboration between the two studios. Since fan anxiety was growing, Itsuno assured them that Capcom was satisfied with sales in the end to approve a sequel. He did, originally, want to make a sequel to DMC Devil May Cry, but since Ninja Theory was not going to be involved, he felt it wouldn't have the same personality. Thank God. Opinions on that game aside, 
it did make sense to go back to the series the main studio was more familiar with. In order to keep the game appealing to every single person on the planet, they made sure the game would feature both Dante and Nero, so everyone got to play as their best boys, but not the women. Someone didn't understand the moral of Devil May Cry 4. The development team would further expand to include those who were familiar with the RE engine. It all comes full circle, doesn't it? There isn't too much troubled development that's documented at least. They had all their experience gained over the years. They had devs who could help them get up to speed on the new engine. They knew veteran fans still wanted the game to be challenging, but they also knew that Nero would be a better starting point for newcomers. As a result, Dante wouldn't be playable until later into the campaign. All solid ideas. So, more than 10 years after the previous mainline entry, the fifth Devil May Cry type game was finally released. Devil May Cry 5 is the first game to let you play as V from the Devil May Cry series. A statement that might sell a game by itself. Nero is the bad boy, Dante is the goofy guy, and V is the morose man of the series. He's more concerned about partaking in slam poetry competitions and listening to somber melodic melodies than fighting demons. In other words, Emo finally got their representation in the series. For what it's worth, I enjoy playing as V. His biggest problem, besides all the angst, is that he's a character in a game where you can play as Nero, Dante, and now Virgil, a rough set of siblings to be constantly compared to. On his own, this is like Chaos Legion, but good. It's so good that while I've never experienced anything exactly like it, I found it completely intuitive. Which is extremely impressive given that it's almost like second person gameplay if that makes sense. It's really cool to see Devil May Cry's take on a puppet character. The only thing I think he lacks is just a little extra sauce. However, comparing V to the first cracks at every other character in the franchise, he might be one of the best. There's only one very obvious downside to V that I consistently notice whenever I stream this game to my friends in Discord, and that's while he's fun to play, He's not fun to watch. If you're watching V gameplay, pay attention to the summons because that's where all the action is. It might look like V players are walking around while the game autopilots, but that's not true. They're mashing buttons to make it autopilot. The game starts with a menu screen where players get a recap of all the side material not covered in this video. After some poetry, Dante and friends are fighting in a demonic tower just like the good old days. Nero wonders why he's even here because Dante never needs help anyway. V assures Nero that this demon is not to be underestimated. After all, he was the one that chopped off Nero's arm. Thus the game starts by removing Nero's core gimmick. Nero battles his way through the tutorial to show us that they did learn a very important lesson from the reboot. The style meter now has an announcer to tell the player how cool they are. It's such a perfectly fitting change that it's a wonder that they didn't think of it earlier. Seriously, this feels like it's always been here because of how much sense it makes. So there's that, and the dynamic cinematic camera is now gone. Rest in peace, I am one of the three people who misses it. The demon is giving Dante, Lady, and Trish a run for their money. Guess this wasn't a waste of Nero's time after all. Hey, that's my line. In a battle to get his gimmick back, Nero fights a crystal instead of the demon. Maybe he can finally prove he's as good as Dante. I spoke too soon. Dante gets his second wind and insists that Nero retreats because... Nero's ego is so shattered that he's more concerned about that comet than the fact that Dante is about to make a martyr of himself. V drives the point home. Nero will be all that's left to defeat Urizen should Dante fail. Nero and V have a nice Marvel landing, and Morizen, the job contract provider that we are all very familiar with at this point, is in disbelief that Dante lost. We flash forward to Nero's road trip with Nico, a weaponsmith that we also know very well at this point in the series. Nero casually asks her how she feels about being on a mission to save the guy that killed her father. Her father is Science Bug Boy from Devil May Cry 4, in case you were wondering. So, that means Nero also tried to kill him, but he fails to see how attempted murder and murder murder are not all that different. Popping a cigarette, Nico expresses that he was a terrible father, so she doesn't really care. His research did come in handy, though. With all the demons clogging up the road, Nero puts on his favorite vinyl, and I get to see how much I can get away with sampling the arguably now most iconic song from this franchise without triggering content ID. 
Daily reminder that Casey Edwards was stressed that fans wouldn't like this song, proving that all artists lack confidence in their work. All the demon killing doesn't make Nero happy about Nico's smoking habit. We also do not promote the use of tobacco products here at Misshapen Chair LLC. The second most competent military faction in a video game doesn't stand a chance against all the basic Goomba equivalents. Thankfully, one-armed Nero is here to kick gum and chew ass with his new prosthetics. That's right, unlike his original game, Nero has an arsenal of mechanical arms that Nico develops for him. Each one has a surprising amount of depth between their basic function, what they do when charged up, and detonating them to cycle to the next one in the stack. We could sit here and discuss the optimal setup or the fact that one of them is literally just the Devilbringer finisher, but that defeats the point. A true Devil May Cry player knows it's not about using the tools to do damage, it's about using the tools to look cool. Nero must cleanse this world of the newest invasive species, the Clyphod. This boss is very uneventful. That's why it ends with a flashback of Nero having both of his arms. A mysterious murder hobo shows up at his garage, which causes his demonic arm to start glowing. I wonder what that could possibly mean. If only I knew who this man was. Maybe Kyrie, who never appears on screen for the entire game, would know. Nero passes out from the blood loss in the flashback, but we know he's okay because he's here in the present. Long story short, the giant demonic trees are sucking up human blood to give Urizen power. It makes sense to take them all down one at a time before going back to the big one where he resides. Nero chases after V in the city of London to not let him have all the fun to himself. He goes through a hotel to reinforce that there is no cinematic camera. He also fights a butcher in the smallest Michigan pothole. So Nero takes a spin in the newest ambulance. Nero immediately activates his saucy one-liners to mimic the story of David and Goliath from the Bible. It's about how Goliath was defeated by Nero who didn't have enemy step, which is what I'm used to using to dodge everything. Speaking of which, this is the game where being able to jump cancel every move in existence became a true mechanic. Some stuff still requires a full commitment, but watching high-level Devil May Cry 5 gameplay involves watching someone string together 50 jumps to execute combos at ludicrous speed. Enemy Step is a massive game changer as soon as it's unlocked. It genuinely feels like a different game. If you're trying to up your style, begin to incorporate more jumps, as it's the building block for everything else. So I'm not good at it. Goliath is not allowed to die right away because he also needs V to show up and lay down some sweet William Blake poetry. Blake also did several illustrations for the Divine Comedy, so it does make sense. V also summons a bird and a panther that might be similar to some enemies from Devil May Cry 1. I wonder what that means. After getting together, Nero and V split up to cover more ground. Nero takes a stroll through some sunken buildings from Death Stranding and skates around on a rocket-powered fist. God, it's so good. Then the game makes me sad by reintroducing the Sharpie Sniffers. And I don't hate them. This is because they can be parried into losing their weapons. Then, when they try to regrow them, they're vulnerable to an instant kill. <laughs> it's fucking beautiful. Surely, a boss that flies around like an asshole wouldn't be a bad time. After defeating that enemy, a naked lady pops out. Kyrie might have a problem with this if she ever found out about it. But it's also clear that Lady was turned into a demon-like monster after her loss to Urizen. We then cut back to V's perspective. After splitting up, V explains to the flying bird that even though he's weak, he must act himself rather than delegating it to others. The bird responds with, I got your back. This diet is whack. Whoever localizes these games needs a raise. To show how weak V is, he unleashes his devil trigger to summon Nightmare and completely eviscerate everything in his path. Alright, it's technically not V himself that does all of this, it's his summons. His other shtick is that V can only double jump if Birdie is alive, or dodge roll if Panther is. Trying to do either while they are in combat will cause them to teleport back to V so he can use his mobility skills. That's a useful trick to force summons to retreat. Contrary to what I said before, V has some sauce. V desecrates the newest Banksy to get a collectible, maybe he is a monster. Or maybe the payphone infrastructure is, considering that it still works after all this property damage. V faces off against the parasitic demon known as Nidhogg that's infected this particular Clyphod. On higher difficulties, this fight can be kind of a pain. On normal, it's not too bad. 
This victory destroys one tree but reveals another. That tree sentinel is more dangerous so it's a good time to retreat. Guess the sewers aren't the worst place to surf around with demonic powers. I did not get sidetracked into doing a bonus mission while embarrassing myself live on stream multiple times. V defeats a giant bug monster that I always manage to get command grab by in reference to my skill at fighting games. After getting a bit further, he stumbles into a big demon that's clearly high up the political ladder. She's searching for the Devil Sword Sparta. It fell into obscurity after Trish was defeated alongside Dante and Lady. She was told it's not important, but she can't take risks as long as a descendant of Sparta still exists. V strategically waits for the strong demon to leave before challenging the knight on a time-traveling horse. Which is surprising, because Dante supposedly killed the last time-traveling horse back in Devil May Cry 3. A little slow-mo never hurt anyone. Despite landing the sick finisher on the horse, V doubles over in the cutscene to show he's actually running on fumes. I wonder how strong he would be if he wasn't slowly dying. Birdie reminds us that you need to be strong in body and mind to wield the Sparta, which V is anything but. That might be true, but what about Nero? Earlier, Nero stumbled into that bigger, stronger demon that sent V into the sewers. This is probably the biggest boss blemish on this game because it's a slog other than seeing if you can keep yourself on top the whole fight. At least he gets to wave the V cinematically at one point. That's pretty cute. Upon destroying the walking fortress, it's clear that this was also a tree root. Something big's going on here. Lady wakes up to explain what little she remembers. Trish was captured just like her, but she doesn't know what happened to Dante. V and Lady proceed to have a nice, polite, awkward conversation. I'm glad to see you look so well. You too, I guess. Lady asks if V is trustworthy, but it's not like they have a choice in the matter. The car can't get through, so V and Nero go ahead on foot, while Lady and Nico start digging their way through all the demonic foliage. Seems kinda stupid when there's a perfectly dysfunctional subway to traverse. My favorite part was when I ran past the escalators that were shooting at me making this a metaphor for American public infrastructure. Nero stumbles upon the concert hall that Dante performed at in Devil May Cry 3, not really, and has to fight against the tankiest basic enemies in existence because this is actually a boss fight. Sliding down the hillside leads them to the diverging point where V tells Nero to go on ahead while he finds the Sparta. Nero doesn't think that's a good idea given what the Sparta has done in the past. V responds by saying they need all the help they can get. Nico does a sick drift to prove that the car really can go anywhere, and all the shoveling was just for show. Nico then drives Nero to the tree from the start of the game. Inside the primary Clyphod Tower, Nero simply fights his way to the top all by himself. He's a big strong boy who don't need no emotional support. The new mage type enemy that shoots ice is no match for his sick dance moves. Neither is the bonus platforming mission. It's a long journey, so there's no possible way that Nico could ever get her car up here. Well, I guess Nero helped clear the way. Alright, Yurizen, time for a rematch. This boss uses all the primary attacks from the previous bosses up until this point. It's meant to be like a mini training arc, which is why I always struggle. Nero manages to break the crystal and land a single hit, which causes the nameless demon to stand up. Oh shit. Nero explains that the funny thing about humans is that they don't know when to give up. Who the hell is that? Four weeks ago, Dante has run out of money by spending it all on pizza. He can't even keep the utilities running in his office. Once again proving, Dante is a man of the people. Cash up front. This, I like. Now that he has some money to keep the place running, he turns down an invitation to be in the next Smash Brothers. Morrison says he's getting Lady and Trish to come along because this is a big job. V is his client, and I don't canonically know where he got all the money to pay for this gig, and I don't care. V explains that this job involves stopping a powerful demon from being summoned. Dante laughs because that sounds like business as usual. V elaborates that the name of this demon is special because it's Dante's reason for fighting. If only we could hear what they were saying. Back in the present-ish, V continues his journey through some catacombs and some painfully nostalgic buildings. I wonder why the past is so bitter for him. The Sparta isn't very hard to find because a group of demons are worshipping it as a god. Hey, I've seen this one before. A little cleanup duty later, and the Sparta is ours. I know that guy. V loses control while holding the Sparta, and starts ranting that his life would have been a lot easier if Dante never existed. But he didn't actually kill him because he was just doing a bit. 
In Dante's nightmare, we see that Dante's house was under attack and his mother, who looks like Trish, hid him away and told him that he had to change his identity if she didn't come back while looking for Virgil. Dante wakes up and wonders what day it is. It's June 15th, so he's been out for a month. The birdie explains that Nero's on his way to die to Urizen. And Dante says that he should have left Nero out of this. V retorts by saying he wouldn't have had to use Nero if Dante won in the first place. Flashing back again to a month ago, we see the OG crew plus V walk into the demon lair. Dante says it might be a bit too much for V to handle, and he actually leaves. What a chad. Dante makes an offhand comment about how he wants to see if the demon is really him. I wonder what he meant by this. After all this edging, it's time to play as Dante from the Devil May Cry series, featuring real-time style switching yet again. Contrary to popular belief, Perfect Timing Royal Guard is about a 6 frame window, which I find to be kinda hard. Just jumping gives about a billion in vulnerability frames, and so does using Trickster. They are much safer and still give Devil Trigger if used at the last possible second. Which means, Royal Guard is what you use to style. I believe that every game needs a set of fists that shout Ignite the flame! Fired up! Now! And allow players to break dance on enemies while kicking their ass and then bob and weave like it's god hand. Dante has an arsenal of every offensive and defensive tactic under the sun. Once jump cancelling starts to be incorporated, it makes me wonder how anyone does this. However, I find that Dante's damage output is already quite high. Some basic combos are all that's necessary to beat the game on the highest difficulty with a big fat S rank. But it takes a lot of time and dedication to look the part. Since we start with Dante's traditional weapon set, he also gets the classic dualies, shotgun, and of course, the rebellion. Now that's a stinger that'll win over the ladies. Dante gets to the demon at the top of the tower and watches Lady and Trish lose. Dante is impressed because those are the two most badass women he knows, and there's only one other guy that could beat them. Jackpot. Dante. I feel like this is revealing something. Dante fights the demon and forgets to grab the rocket launcher that Lady dropped in the heat of the moment. Then it all plays out like the beginning of the game. Except we see Trish give Dante the Sparta, and he gets blasted off again. That brings us back to now. Dante takes the Sparta and leaves V to go save Nero. V doesn't seem to be keeping it together all that well. Dante warms up by doing some demolition work, and I walk by the rocket launcher about 50 times in a row. It's just a DSP impersonation. The hordes of Hell's strongest soldiers are no match for my mediocre skills. Turns out, Dante isn't all that stiff after all those pizza withdrawals. I think I've seen this somewhere before. This boss rocks. I'm not being sarcastic. It just feels good to fight. Lots of different options and lots of different ways to show off. Pure Devil May Cry at its finest. It turns out that Neo Angelo is actually Trish and a motorcycle. Since V is here, he leaves Trish behind as she's clearly trying to tell him something. When she wakes up, she demands to know who Urizen is. That's not a demon that she's aware of, and she is from the underworld, she would know. On second thought, who the hell is V? V explains how he was born. After being handed nothing but L's, a certain someone's body was falling apart. Literally. But he couldn't let it end there. He still had one thing left to do. Defeat his twin brother, Dante. In a last ditch effort, our favorite son of Sparta used the Yamato to split his devil and human halves. His human half somehow got tatted out of his mind in an instant while his devil half became a true devil. So yes, Urizen is Virgil's demon half and V is his human half. Putting them together, you get Vurizen. V, being a pure human, was immediately racked with the guilt of all the crimes he committed in the pursuit of power. The reason why he sought out Dante to defeat Urizen is probably some foolish notion of redemption. He asked Trish if what he did was right, but remember, Trish only looks like his mom. She says he can figure it out for himself. Dante does some sick tricks to demonstrate the third best weapon in the series. The motorcycle chainsaw hybrid that splits in half and shreds enemies to death. With proper timings, it's much faster than at first glance, and it even has the option to do donuts and pop endos in enemies' faces. Demonic Motorcycle? One of my personal favorites. Dante is on a quest to go back to his childhood home, believing it will have some answers. He has to pour a bunch of blood into a demonic mechanism that thankfully, still works. Demonic engineering is almost as resilient as the payphone infrastructure in this universe. What does this mean for the lore implications? 
He encounters an elite teleporter enemy that I never properly learned how to deal with, so I'm gonna go into training mode immediately. Now that he has arrived to the central point of nostalgia, Dante reminisces about awakening to his Devil Trigger when he was lovingly stabbed with the Rebellion in Devil May Cry 3. Why did his father give him the Rebellion and Virgil the Yamato? If the Yamato can separate a man and demon, what about the Rebellion? Dante absorbs the Devil Sword Sparta to unlock his Super Devil Trigger, allowing him to instantly teleport to Nero's battle and bail him out yet again. Hey, he's all yours. But don't let it become a habit. You cannot kill me. I am subhuman. Dante is able to easily defeat Urizen, saying he still doesn't get it. Urizen teleports away because the ritual is almost complete. The world continues to fall apart as Dante regroups with V to figure out where Urizen went. The answer? This is the bottom of the Clyphod's upper echelon. In order to stop Urizen from eating the forbidden fruit that will grant him even more power, they have to go down. Nico materializes to fangirl over Dante, giving Fujoshi their self-insert, and giving him a new weapon that's also a hat. <laughs> Tell me it's an edgelord simulator after this. Dante insists that Nero sit this one out, but Nero refuses to be called dead weight again. So, Dante goes off alone and lets Nero and V figure it out for themselves. Dr. Faust allows you to turn any enemy into a fedora-wearing neckbeard that will drop red orbs when being attacked. As a trade-off, you will lose red orbs if you are embarrassingly struck by said neckbeard. It also costs red orbs to fire. To compensate, it does insane damage and is very flashy. The perfect embodiment of high risk, high reward, stylish gameplay. It's even the best thing to grind out red orbs and ignore the microtransactions. This is all fantastic. Once the weapon is upgraded and you have a surplus of orbs after that, when you first unlock it, it's basically worthless. You know what isn't worthless though? The Devil Sword Dante. This bad boy is like the Rebellion, except it shoots out four additional Mirage Blades that completely destroy everything in sight. So it's pretty alright. Meanwhile, V's journey to the Underworld is interrupted by the hauntings of previous bosses. In reference to Devil May Cry 3, he has to regain his summons one at a time while picking what bosses to fight. Don't actually take the bird first, I did it for fun. The EDM here also kinda slaps. As far as the rest of V's gameplay goes, Devil Trigger can be spent to power up his basic summons for a bit, or just summon Nightmare to autopilot on them. The autopilot is only true if you don't use the special power to ride his back. This segment helped me appreciate the finer details of his kit by being forced to use them. Big points to the creators yet again. After managing to get it together, V stumbles upon that one demon he avoided earlier. Hopefully he doesn't knock a rock over to alert them. Does she just do that at every sound she hears in this place? How the hell did Nero get here? Well, by playing his level, we do a platforming challenge that's only possible with Jerbera and acquiring some extra blue orb fragments. That's basically it. So Nero fights the boob chicken lady demon, which is a fight that I like. This is a controversial opinion. Nero wins by punching her in the tits. Afterwards, Nero insists that V taps out because he's clearly not going to make it. However, he is convinced after seeing how desperate V is. Dante is further ahead by virtue of not having to drag V along. So he gets to the Guardian of the Fruit. Oh no. Not that boss I didn't get walled by in Devil May Cry 3. The music is kinda goofy though. Let me just restate the photosensitivity warning before this two second bit. Honestly, I wasn't sure if I should keep it in the video, but uh... Close your eyes if you're scared. Dante demonstrates that he was the one who let the dogs out, and acquires the cool multi-elemental nunchucks that also turn into a flaming staff. While using this weapon in combat, Dante will make sounds. A friend of mine once asked me why he does this, and the answer is because he's Dante. Back to the Backstreet Boys, V says, Alright, the truth then. There is no Urizen, only a man who threw away his humanity in the pursuit of power. And that man is Virgil, Dante's brother. Based on his expression, I think Nero understands the plot perfectly. Dante finally reaches Virgil as he's about to eat the super pomegranate. He begins smack talking as a distraction. He says that this place resembles their childhood home, and that it's where it all began. Where Dante was saved, and when Virgil 
was left alone. Virgil insists that he doesn't remember, and now that he has the sacred fruit, he has everything. No, brother. You don't have everything. You see, he threw away the last of his humanity. In a twist of irony, this Urizen fight is easier than all the previous ones. Or maybe it's supposed to be this way, because as full devil Virgil says as he's getting his ass kicked, How are you so powerful? You never lost anything. It's not about loss. Strength is about having something to protect. Because Virgil threw everything away in the name of power, he lost that which gives him power. To spell it out, it's the human half of Dante that makes him strong. Everybody's here now, and Nero confirms with Dante that he's following the plot. V walks over to Urizen to land the final blow, except WAIT A MINUTE! God, I love this cutscene. <laughs> Virgil thanks Nero for leading him here, and goes into a portal to go to the top of the tower yet again. In a tribute to Devil May Cry 4, we do not have to do all those levels backwards. Nero still doesn't comprehend that V and Virgil are the same person. Guess Sunday school wasn't particularly helpful. Dante once again insists that Nero stays behind, but Nero says he needs to get his arm back. At least Virgil didn't call him dead weight. He's your father! If only this was foreshadowed. That's right though, Dante was doing all that smack talk to protect Nero from the truth. He refuses to let Nero kill his own father. At the final boss arena, Virgil ponders if this was always his fate. If he and Dante switched places on that fateful day, would they trade lives? Is this a case of nature versus nurture? A final battle will settle the matter. The dream is collapsing, so the ladies have to retreat while Dante takes care of his quote, dumbass brother. Give the localizers another raise. Nico gives Dante a second rocket launcher to combine with the first one to make a super rocket launcher. Just like how it works in real life. Some people will say this weapon sucks, I say, look at this giant piss stream it shoots out. Dante finds Virgil's summons, which are his abominable thoughts that manifested when he was Angelo in Devil May Cry 1. Yeah, that's the retcon. That's why we have to live out our best DMC1 adventures and fight all the bosses like the good old days. This nightmare battle is honestly one of the hardest fights in the game. I use Faust to cheese it on my hard playthrough, I have no shame. As far as the plot is concerned, they knew they didn't stand a chance against Dante, but if he couldn't beat them, he doesn't stand a chance against Virgil. This marks the end of Virgil's nightmare, and they wish him luck. Nero manages to catch a ride. He demands answers. Who the hell is Virgil and is he really his father? Triss explains that it makes sense. They were 99% sure since Devil May Cry 4. Nero punches a wall in frustration. Trish understands that Nero holds a grudge against Virgil, but he can't kill his own father. Lady concurs. Killing your own father results in some unhealthy trauma. She would know. Nero jumps out of the vehicle because he wants some of that familial trauma for himself. Ah, just like old times. Time to finish this, Virgil! Once and for all. Dante and Virgil still need to duke it out to prove who's the bigger son of Sparta, and who has the biggest super devil trigger. Dante manages to get it through to Virgil that he cut off his own son's arm for power. Virgil finally realizes, Nero is his son. Guess he forgot about that power-up all those years ago. But that's not important right now. What is important is putting all their might into a final attack. Who the hell is this? Right before the final battle, Nero found another functioning payphone and decided to call up Kyrie before figuring out what to do next. Instead of running away from the truth, he opens up about the fact that he was an orphan. Her and Kratos were his family as far as he was concerned, but now he learns that he has a biological family that's going through it and doesn't know what to do. You always know which path is right and which is wrong. There's no need to doubt yourself. Thanks. I guess that's all I needed to hear. Nero has constantly been beaten up by the writers, never allowed to shine and constantly in the shadow of Dante. He hated himself for not being able to save Kratos. But this time is different. I swear! I'm not letting you die! 
Nero never needed the Yamato. He had all the power inside of him all along. As the series is always showing, true power comes from love, not hate. Also, he can fly now, which is pretty convenient. Dante and Virgil are knocked on their asses, seeing Nero become a real man and asserting that this conflict is over. Dante tries his usual shtick, but it doesn't go very well. Except Nero is still more concerned with the deadweight comet than anything else. But he's made his point clear. Nobody's going to die today. Not Dante, not Virgil. Uh, you came all this way just for that. Virgil refuses to drop it, so he says if he can beat Nero, that counts as beating Dante. And Dante just kind of agrees because he wants to take it easy for a minute. Nero gets to have a polite conversation with his father about their- Fuck you! Not very classy for someone's fighting words. Yet. Of your existence or your strength. Both, you fucking asshole! Only in Devil May Cry can you save a man's life by kicking his ass. Dante makes fun of Virgil for cutting off his own son's arm for power and still losing to him. However, Virgil insists that he can still fight. But there's bigger problems at the moment. In order to stop the big tree, Virgil and Dante have to sever the Clyphod roots from the underworld itself. Nero doesn't want to have his family ripped away from him yet again and get trapped in the underworld. Virgil tells Nero that he's not going to lose next time. So, Dante and Virgil work together and solve the problem in about 5 minutes. Also, with how often people come back from the underworld, I doubt it means much. As Nico and Nero drive into the sunset, she asks how it feels to save the man who killed his father. Because Dante did kill Virgil once or twice, I guess. Nero says that it doesn't matter because it's all over now. Nico says it's okay to cry because... Devils sometimes cry. Does make you a little bitch, though. I feel like I'm missing something. Don't you dare say it, Jackpot! A fitting end to the game. But now we can play through the whole thing again as the storm that is approaching. After all the previous special editions, it's what's expected. Except for a true final boss fight against Dante himself. Where he will touch of death combo Virgil if given the opportunity and talk shit if he wins. I can believe they went this hard. That vocal opening to bury the light is fucking flawless. It's what the fans deserve. After finishing the Virgil DLC, we get to the current canon where it's likely that Virgil will never meet his grandkids because he's an absent father. That's enough. This brings us to a good question though, which is, would I want a sequel? The answer to that is, kinda. If the development team felt like they were up for it, and they weren't forced to work on it just because it's an established IP, then yeah, the Backstreet Boys teaming up against a common threat isn't unprecedented, and they could easily make a satisfying storyline if they try. As far as gameplay goes, they've always given the player more options and more intricacy in every game. I think the only progression left at this point would be going from all this freedom to also being able to swap characters on the fly. And the way they could easily integrate this 
is by having all three characters use the Yamato, because all of them have used it at some point in the series. However, if the story ended right here, and Dante himself is the final boss ever made for the series, I think this is a very satisfying endpoint. In conclusion, Devil May Cry 5 is one of the Devil May Cry type games of all time. I could list minor preferences for previous games, but I don't feel like doing that. The combat is insanely polished, the story is a giant camp fest, and the characters feel like they could be slapped together anywhere and make it entertaining. As I played through all these games, there was a beautiful moment where the combat systems just clicked for me, and I could start executing almost whatever I wanted to. I can go back to Devil May Cry 5 anytime and have a blast. As for the story, it's clear that Dante never wanted to kill Virgil at any point in the series. He just wants to stop him from making poor life decisions. However, Virgil is too deep into his pursuit of power to stop. It's also clear that Virgil hides the fact he has a silly side. It's why he plays along with Dante's antics whenever he shows up. Dante's smack talk also isn't pointless. He uses it to hide the truth from Nero, and to try to get Virgil angry enough so that he will be distracted and not eat the forbidden fruit. It's cool that they found a way to tie it directly into the narrative. Nero has always been frustrated at the hand he's been dealt, largely living through the shame of being a demon. It is already hinted that it does not work the way that he thinks it does, because he mentioned awakening to his powers for the first time when he tried to protect Kyrie. But it's by accepting the dark parts of himself and deciding to use it to save a life that he's able to find true power. It's so cheesy, but like a quattro for manji. That means it tastes good. However, there is one glaring issue that this game has which I can't ignore. It's not obvious until you try to get good and play the game on Dante Must Die. When you die, first, you have to wait for the camera to zoom in on the character being all sad, wait for the options to appear, choose if you want to use one of the revival options, if you choose no, wait for the character to die for real this time, see the camera pan up to the game over screen pop up, and then finally choose to restart from the checkpoint or level start. Comparing this to all the previous games, it's so fucking slow. Fast resets in difficult games are borderline essential. I don't think it's an engine limitation because I've heard it can be modded out, so I guess this is the intended experience. I don't think it's for microtransaction reasons either, because if that were true, they would want players to reset a billion times in a row and burn through all the resources so that they might be tempted to buy more. I don't know how they managed to screw it up given that Devil May Cry 3 is basically the gold standard for resets in hard games. It's not a deal breaker by any means, but this is one thing I will say is objectively worse in Devil May Cry 5. In conclusion conclusion, it should be obvious, but I do adore this franchise. It's not perfect, but that's true for anything bar Nekopara. It's hard not to see Devil May Cry's influence damn near everywhere. It doesn't help that the creator of Bayonetta also made the original Devil May Cry, but that statement undermines Itsuno's and his team's work over the years. They're the ones that turned the series into a classic. They might not have made the foundation, but pretending like they didn't construct the building would be an insult. It can make me wonder though, why do I like Devil May Cry so much? Well, for one, it's extremely campy, but it's not winking at the camera and constantly reassuring me that it's okay to have a good time. Instead, it delivers everything with such sincerity. Devil May Cry 3 might not have the highest quality dub, but Dante saying, My soul is saying it wants to stop you! And Virgil going, Unfortunately, our souls are at odds, brother. I need more power. It's perfect. Nobody talks like that in real life, but this is a video game. It's a fine line to walk, but they just kind of do it. Kind of like how Dante starts dancing after getting Dr. Faust. Obviously, some people hate it for that, but I'm glad the series is so unapologetically itself. I can even compliment the reboot for that one. It's totally okay being a series that will not appeal to everyone. It's nice to see big companies support these types of games. Please buy them so we get more. That's all fine and good, 
But while the series is known for being over the top, I think it's actually its restraint that makes it so great. Even though the player might have insanely powerful tools at their disposal, it still takes work to maximize them. Judgment Cut End is sick, but the move itself is just an auto mode. The fact that it requires build up to get to that point and has a long vulnerable windup is what helps it stay so satisfying. It knows when to pull back and when to let loose. I feel like a lot of other action games inspired by Devil May Cry focus too much on the spectacle, because when you actually play the games, it spaces the coolness out quite a bit more than you might think. That attitude has been consistent as they expand upon each game. Something like Quadruple S is disgustingly strong, but it's useless to players who aren't able to get a smoke and sexy style combo in the first place. Even though the story is ridiculous in the moment, its overall attitude is grounded. Virgil is an edgelord and is rightfully portrayed as a villain and a tragedy. It doesn't mean he isn't cool, I obviously like Virgil, but they don't present it like it's a good thing to throw away everything in your life. Him being the antagonist is what allows him to be so cool. A little bit of self-awareness goes a long way. And finally, the second game was allowed to happen and Devil May Cry 4 was ultimately allowed to not meet sales expectations. Neither of them marked the end of the franchise. As the games have passed through different developers, they were allowed to try new ideas to varying degrees of success, but games like these don't become good after one iteration. The first game isn't widely considered to be the best for a reason. It never let itself stagnate. Shinji Mikami understood that all those years ago when he was trying to make Resident Evil 4. He still understands that as he uses his position to try and elevate new developers into the spotlight. Yeah, that offhanded joke about him making Hi-Fi Rush is not really true. He wasn't the one who personally made the game, but putting his stamp on it helped it get more attention. The reward for taking a risk like that is creating a very successful new IP that's destined to get the studio shut down for good. In the wake of massive studio layoffs and studio closures, it's frustrating to be deeply intertwined with this industry. Devil May Cry was not the most popular series in existence when it first came out. And it almost seems impossible for something like it to get made today. Yet, when something cool and creative does finally come along, it means absolutely nothing for the ghouls in charge of these companies. The Devil May Cry games that succeeded the most were created when they had the time to make what they wanted and the flexibility to do something different. I don't want to make a glorified message that creative freedom guarantees a game will be good. But it's the only way it can be. There are so many creators trying to make games that they think people will enjoy and it is always frustrating to watch the executives undervalue the people behind it. I didn't acknowledge every person who touched this series in this video. It's not just the scenario writers or the directors who make the game. Itsuno certainly knows how important it is to keep people on board because he managed to convince Morihashi to stick around when he wanted to quit. But there's also people like Yuji Shinomura, who coordinate all the action in the cutscenes. Or Tetsuya Shibata, who did a lot of the music. Those are just the big names, but there are so many more people than just them. The voice actors, the programmers, the artists, the animators, the localizers. None of these games would have succeeded without them. Development teams are not a machine that always churn out bangers. They're people putting their heart and soul into their work. To put it bluntly, it's the human element that makes games so damn fun. Now let's get out there and just blast Devils Never Cry again. Bless me with your gift of light. Special thanks to Turbo for letting me steal that Devil Trigger remix. You didn't have to make it so easy for me, so I appreciate it. And as always, thanks to my patrons who make it possible for me to make long, high-risk videos about a game series that's from the Neolithic period. If you too want to waste money every month, there's probably a really cool loot box program still out there somewhere. Your